Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me back here once again. It's great to be with you all. Please open your Bibles to Matthew, Matthew chapter 8, Gospel of Matthew chapter 8. Now, in this passage, Jesus has just given the Sermon on the Mount. This is directly after the Sermon on the Mount. Great crowds of people. And now he's entering this uh, village called Capernaum. So Matthew chapter 8 and his verse 5 to 13. Matthew 8, verses 5 to 13. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. So what he's saying here is that he recognizes who Jesus is, and he recognizes that Jesus has authority over these things, illness, demonic possession. He knows that Jesus has authority over all these things. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. So great faith shown on the part of here of a Roman centurion, which Jesus said he hadn't found in all of Israel. Now, the Bible tells us this, that we are saved by grace through faith. It's not our works that save us. It's by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. So none of us will be able to boast when we stand before that throne on the day of judgment. None of us will be able to boast about our own goodness or our own works. It's all about what Jesus did for us. It's not what we can do for Jesus to earn our place in that heavenly kingdom. It's about what he has done for us. Now, this has always been the case. Salvation by grace through faith is nothing new. It's always been the case, even in the Old Testament. People often ask me, how were people saved in the Old Testament? Exactly the same as we are now. It's all by grace through faith. There's an Old Testament verse quoted three times in the New Testament. It's quoted in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. The righteous shall live by faith. Now, this comes from the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Now, the Hebrew word there for faith is emunah. Emunah is the Hebrew word for faith. But in this text in Habakkuk, in the Hebrew text, it's emunato. That means live by his faith. The righteous will live by his faith. Now, in Hebrew language, these words who have the same root, they're normally connected, especially theologically. So the word for truth is emet, emet. And the word for faith is emunah. Emunah means to be steadfast and firm. So it means to be steadfast and firm in the truth. Because the word emet, it has the same root as emunah. So it means to be steadfast in the truth. And Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, salvation by grace also goes back to the beginning as well. Again, this is nothing new. We see this in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, the Hebrew word there for grace is chen. chen. There's another word for grace, which we often see in the Bible more so than this. It's chesed. chesed. And that's when we see words like steadfast love, your, your steadfast love, Lord. The word there is chesed. Now, there's a difference in that chesed is more like a two-way thing, whereas chen is just God's grace to you. It's a one-way thing. That's the difference. And we only see this word here in Genesis 6, 8. So grace goes back to the very beginning. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Salvation in the Old Testament has always been by grace through faith. 
Now, what has changed is the atonement. Remember, I spoke to you last time I was here. We spoke about the Day of the Atonement, Yom Kippur. The atonement has changed. The Old Testament atonement was done by this uh, Levitical sacrificial system, which was the, the goats and the bulls and the lambs, etc. But now Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. He is the one-time sacrifice, once and for all time, which not only covers our sins, but removes our sins. Those animals could only cover the sins of the people. However, the blood of Jesus removes our sins once and for all time. So the atonement has changed under the new covenant. But under the old covenant, observing the law and the sacrifices, these things meant nothing if no one had repentance or faith. You still had to have repentance and faith in order for these things to apply to you. So it's no different today. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He died for the sins of the entire world. But this atonement is meaningless to those who refuse to repent and believe. You must repent and put your faith and trust in Jesus. Otherwise, the atonement is absolutely meaningless to you. Now, recently, I gave a commentary on Hebrews 11. Back at CFM, I gave a commentary on Hebrews 11, the Faith Hall of Fame. In Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 3, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So these things that we cannot see, we still see evidence for them. We still see their effects. You can't see wind, but you can see the effects of wind. You can't see gravity, but you can see the effects of gravity. We know these things exist because of the effects that they leave behind. And it's the same with God. We can't see God, but we can see his effects. We see changed lives. We see his miraculous work in this world amongst his church. Now, Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, Jesus was displeased with the lack of faith on part of the Jews in Israel. There was a severe lack of faith, wasn't there? But he was pleased with this kind of faith that he saw in this Roman centurion. Now, of course, this centurion was not a Jew. He, was, he would have been a Roman. He was a Gentile. And he must have been well familiar with the Hebrew scriptures. The fact that he was a Gentile then prompted Jesus to allude to something which he alluded to more than once in the Gospels. Verse 10, Assuredly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, that's Israel, will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he's alluding here again to the time where the gospel of salvation will go out to the Gentiles. It will be taken from Israel because of their unbelief, and it will go out to non-Jews, the, the Gentiles. This is something that he alluded to in Luke 4. Quite a while ago, I spoke to you about Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was in the synagogue reading that prophecy from Isaiah, and he spoke about how there was many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, but the only one he was sent to was the widow from Zarephath, a Gentile woman. That's from 1 Kings 17. Then he spoke about Naaman. He said there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha. But the only one who was healed by Elisha was Naaman the Syrian, another Gentile. That's in 2 Kings chapter 5. So Jesus there was alluding to the fact that the gospel will be taken from Israel. God's grace will be taken from Israel and given to the Gentiles. This is what he alluded to in Matthew 22 in the parable of the wedding feast. Remember, he said about the king who was having a feast for his son for the wedding. The ones who were invited, that's the Jews, didn't want to come. They made excuses, didn't they? He said, go and tell those who are invited that the feast is ready, but they didn't want to come. They made excuses. So he said, go out into the highways and byways and invite anyone who you see. That's the Gentiles. Again, he's alluding here to the fact that the gospel is going to go out to the Gentiles. And the reason that he hinted at this so many times was because he was seeing more faith from the Gentiles than he was from his own people, from Israel. Do you remember the Syrophoenician woman? The Syrophoenician woman in Mark 7, also in Matthew 15. O oh woman, your faith is great. Again, another Gentile woman. And he knew that because of the unbelief of the Jewish people, the gospel will be taken from them and given to the Gentiles. Now, this is exactly what Jesus is saying here in the case of this centurion. 
the sons of the kingdom will be banished into outer darkness, while many from east and west will come and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Gentiles will come and sit down with them. However, the gospel, I will reiterate, has only gone out to the Gentiles temporarily. This is not permanently. Jesus and Paul both said that the time of the Gentiles will come to an end. Jesus said that in Luke 21, 24. Paul said that in Romans 11, 25. The time of the Gentiles will come to an end. And the time is going to come where God will revert his grace back to Israel once again when he deals with them in the last days. I won't go into it now because it's a can of worms, but I'll be more than happy to teach about the heresies of replacement theology maybe another time if you're up for that. Turn now to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, a very important chapter to understand when it comes to this subject of faith. James chapter 2. So it tells us in the Bible that this faith, the faith without which it's impossible to please God, the faith that this Roman centurion had, this saving faith will result in action and it will result in works. It's not the other way around. It's not works which results in salvation, it's salvation which results in works. So James chapter 2 from verse 18, James 2, 18 to 26. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. We hear this all the time when we evangelize in the high street. Oh, I believe in God. And we say, yeah, so what? So do demons. What God do you believe in? But you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Right, well, hang on, because we just read only a couple of minutes ago in Ephesians 2 that, that grace by faith, not by works. We are saved by grace, not by works. Now, this is one of the reasons that Martin Luther completely discounted the book of James, because he didn't understand this apparent contradiction. Martin Luther said that the book of James does not belong in the Bible, and that it's not Holy Spirit-inspired scripture. And this is one of the reasons, because Martin Luther was one of the ones who said at the time of the reign of the Catholic Church that salvation is only by grace through faith. But then he sees this passage here in James, and therefore it's seemingly contradicting it therefore it doesn't belong in the bible however these so-called contradictions all they need is a bit of clarity there's no contradictions in the bible there's only misunderstandings so it says in ephesians 2 that we are saved by grace through faith romans 3 28 says we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law and again this is something which people struggle to reconcile why does it say in james that we are justified by works and not by faith only. Well, Ephesians 2 and Romans 3 are talking about works of the law. These are talking about obedience to the law. James 2 is talking about works of faith. There's a big difference. It doesn't mention anything about the law in James chapter 2. Faith results in works. Again, it's not the other way around. Works are an outcome of genuine faith. Now, Faith is not something you say. It's not something you believe. Faith is something you do. And it uses the example of Abraham, doesn't it? Genuine faith results in you taking action. Abraham's faith was proven by his actions. He obeyed God and went to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. Now, we see the faith of Abraham in the book of Genesis in that he knew that Abraham, that Isaac, beg your pardon, was coming back with him some way or another. Because he said to the servants, I and the lad will go up there and worship, and then we will come back to you. He knew one way or another that Isaac was coming back with him. Why? Because God had promised Abraham this son, Isaac. Remember, he had an illegitimate son before that, Ishmael. But he had promised this son through whom the Jewish nation would come and ultimately the Messiah, the descendants of Isaac. But now God is saying to Abraham, go and sacrifice your son. So Abraham's kind of saying, hang on, you've kind of snookered yourself now, God, because you promised me that through this son of mine, that all these great nations are going to come, the nation of Israel and the Messiah, and now you're telling me to go and offer him as a sacrifice. 
So one way or another, God is going to have to do something. God is going to have to raise Isaac from the dead in order for him to keep his promises. This is what Abraham is saying here. He knew that one way or another, Isaac was coming back with him because of his faith. And again, his faith was demonstrated in what? His actions. He took that action. And then obviously God stopped him from sacrificing Isaac. It was a test, a test which Abraham passed because his faith was demonstrated by his actions. His actions lined up with what he claimed. Now, this must be the same with us. We still have so many people in the church whose actions do not line up with their words. If I told you that there's a bomb about to go off in this building, and then I sit back and I light up a cigarette, open a can of beer and sit back and relax, you're not going to believe me, are you? He doesn't believe that because my actions don't line up with my words. And now if I say there's a bomb about to go off in this building, I run over there and I kick the door down and I run out, what are you going to do? You're going to follow me, aren't you? You're going to follow me because my actions are now in line with what I've claimed to believe. And this is how the Bible tells us we should be. Faith is without works is dead. Our faith results in works. So it's not contradicting Ephesians 2. It's not contradicting Romans 3. Works are an outcome of our faith. Works of faith. Let's look closer at these examples of faith which James gives. The faith of Abraham we've already given Genesis 22 5 again stay here with the donkey and I will go and worship there with the boy and we will come back to you now Paul talks about this in the in the book of Romans chapter 4 verses 1 to 5 he talks about the faith of Abraham and he quotes the same thing there from Genesis that the faith of Abraham was accounted for him as righteousness Romans 4 verses 1 to 5 What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So when you go to work every day, you have earned your wages, you are owed those wages, your employer is indebted to you and owes you that money because you have worked for it. But it says now, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So faith is the absence of work. Faith is the opposite of work. We don't work for our salvation. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. And the point that James is making here is that Abraham's faith resulted in action. It wasn't a passive faith. It was an active faith. And that's exactly what That's exactly the best way to understand this passage in James, which seemingly contradicts the rest of the Bible, but not at all. Let's go back to James chapter 2 for the other example that James uses, Rahab. You'll remember Rahab, the harlot in Jericho. What did she do? She hid those spies, didn't she? Joshua sent in two spies, and she knew that God had given the city of Jericho over to the Israelites, and therefore she acted on her faith, and she went and hid those spies, didn't she? And that's why she was rescued from Jericho when the walls came tumbling down. So James chapter 2, verse 25. Likewise was Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Rahab acted on her faith, didn't she? She knew that the city was going to be destroyed. She knew that the Israelites were going to come and conquer it. And therefore, she put her faith in that and she hid those spies and she was rescued from that destruction. Now, God said to Isaiah in Isaiah 1.18, come now and let us reason together. God does not require us to put our faith in anything unreasonable. Our faith is a reasonable faith. To be saved, we must believe that Jesus died for our sins and that he rose from the dead. That's what God requires us to put our faith in. And again, it's not a blind faith. God never requires us to have a blind faith. We hear this all the time. Oh, it's a blind faith. You know, you have no evidence for it. No, it's not a blind faith whatsoever. If you examine the evidence very clearly, it's very, very, very reasonable, very reasonable. And God does not require us to put anything, put our faith in anything unreasonable. People want evidence all the time, don't they? But we hear this, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, God doesn't say believe it when you see it. He says, believe it, and then you will see it. It's the other way around. The world always gets things the wrong way around, don't they? It's not, I'll believe it when I see it. It's believe it, and you will see it. Now, there's a guy called Sir Lionel Luck who 
Lionel Luck, who he's the world's most successful lawyer. He holds the record for 20, uh, 245 consecutive victories out of 245 cases. He holds the record for the most consecutive victories. He spent his life proving that the resurrection and existence of Jesus Christ is real. He put that evidence through the same scrutiny and, and examination as you would do in a court of law. Now, he put this through a court of law, and this was his conclusion in his book, which he wrote, I humbly add, I have spent more than 42 years as a defense trial lawyer, appearing in many parts of the world, and I'm still active in practice. I have been fortunate to secure a number of successes in jury trials, and I say unequivocally, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. That's from his book, The Question Answered, Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? Absolutely no room for doubt. In a court of law, something must leave no room for doubt. And this is exactly the conclusion that he came to. The world's most successful lawyer came to that conclusion because of the evidence that was put through a court of law. Our faith is not a blind faith. Don't say, I'll believe it when I see it. It's believe it and you will see it. Lee Strobel was a well-known atheist from Chicago an investigative journalist. You must have heard of his book, The Case for Christ. His wife became a Christian. He was devastated. He said, that's it. I'm going to dedicate my life now to disproving this nonsense. I'm going to disprove this rubbish once and for all time. I'm going to disprove that Jesus ever rose from the dead to bring his wife back from the Christian faith. He spent months and months investigating the evidence. He spent months and months looking into things. And the conclusion that he came to is that he could not disprove it. He went on to become a Baptist minister and a professor of Christian thought at Texas University, I think he was. That was the conclusion he came to because he examined the evidence with due consideration. Now, if you do that, you only come to one conclusion, that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life, and that he rose from the dead on the third day for our sins. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, so many people in the church think they're going to heaven because of their works. So many people think they're going to heaven because they're christened as a baby. They think they're going to heaven because some guy sprinkled water on them when he was a baby. That's why they think they're going to heaven. They think they're going to heaven because they serve in the church or because they cut the grass or because they do repairs, something like this. This is what they're putting their faith and trust in. Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. Only those who do the will of my father will be granted into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my father. And what is the will of the father? To believe on him who he sent to believe in Jesus Christ. We cannot please God with our works. Works result in our salvation. We cannot be saved by our works. We are saved by grace through faith. It's always been the case. It's never changed. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. And without this faith, it is impossible to please God. Our works in the Bible apparently are filthy rags, it says. Your works are like filthy rags. Your righteous acts are like filthy rags. Your own goodness and your own righteousness, the Bible says, is like a stench in God's nostrils. That's right. The Bible says that. Your works and your righteousness are a stench in his nostrils. The only thing that can ever justify us, the only thing that can ever please him, is when we forsake our works, when we forsake our own life, deny ourselves, and put our faith and trust in his only son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for the sins of the world. And those who put their faith and trust in him will be forgiven of all sin, he sent his only son that whosoever believe shall never perish, but have eternal life. So without faith it is impossible to please God. And therefore, this is what I'm saying to you this morning. Don't put your faith and trust in your works. Don't put your faith and trust in your goodness because it will get you nowhere. The only way you can be accepted by God, the only way you can be justified is by faith and by God's mercy upon your life. Let us finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, uh, that you have given us your Holy Spirit, Lord, and that you have sealed us for that day of redemption, not because we deserve to be, Lord, but because you have given your dear Son as a sacrifice for our sin, that you have forgiven us of all sin, Lord, by his shed blood. And we thank you now that it's our faith, Lord, that justifies us and not our works, because, Lord, we have nothing to offer you. We have no goodness to offer you. We have no righteousness to offer you, Lord. But we thank you that when we put our faith in your dear Son, you choose not to look at our sin, but we are a new creation now. And you look at us and you see the righteousness of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that on that day, we will be accepted by you, Lord, 
again, not because of our works, but because your dear son has reconciled us to you. We thank you, Lord, that even though we were once estranged from you, that we have now been reconciled to you, Lord, through the death and resurrection of your dear son. And Lord, the disciples said, increase our faith. And Lord, that's our prayer today as well. Increase our faith, Lord. Help us, Lord, in unbelief. Help us, Lord, when we doubt. Give us, Lord, an increase of faith. Give us an increase of gifts and wisdom and discernment, Lord. And Lord, help us to proclaim this message to others. Help us to go out there, Lord, and to bring this message of light into this dark world, to say that God is no longer imputing sins against people, but now Jesus Christ has taken that punishment, that they too may have eternal life when they repent and put their faith and trust in you. Help us to convey that message in this dark world, Heavenly Father. And Lord, I just pray blessing upon each person here, Lord, that they may continue to put their trust and faith in you, and that you, Lord, will continue to raise up the men and women of God who you want in this congregation, Lord. We thank you and praise you. In the name of your dear son, Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.